Welcome to worship at our Savior's Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. So glad we're able to uh, spend this time together in worship. We are now in the season of Lent and continue our Lenten journey. I invite you to check our website, oursaviors.com, to find new ways, different ways to be involved in ministry and service. We begin now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we join together in prayer. Gracious God, your Spirit is always with us. Draw us together in your grace and send us out in service to the world you love. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our worship. Only oh, there's never been anyone like you. There's never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. Oh, and there's never been anyone like you. There's never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. No height or depth can ever make you. message at this time. I'd like to show you something that I have on my wall in my office. This is a, um, a, a carving that was done and was given to our family from my Aunt Carolyn. And it's something that has been around our family for a long time. And, and I like the, the image of Jesus with the little ones. In our uh, gospel reading today, 
uh, one of the things that Jesus says is uh, he's saying to, to Peter at a time when Peter said something that, that Jesus didn't really like, he said, get behind me. And even though this shows the children in front of Jesus, one of the things that that reminded me of was that to get behind Jesus is to follow Jesus. When I was little, kind of like these, these children in this picture, when I was little, I was really quite shy. And when I was quite shy, uh, sometimes they would say that I kind of hid behind my mom's leg that I would uh, hide back there. I would get behind her because it was a safe place to be. But also if I didn't know where I was going, it was easy to be behind somebody and follow along where they were leading the way and then they could guide me as to where I was going. And so just like when I was little, when we get behind Jesus, when we follow Jesus, it is a safe place for us to be while we follow and learn the way to go. And when we follow by getting behind Jesus, we can follow him into lives of service and love. I wonder if you might think of ways this week that you can get behind Jesus, feeling safe and serving others. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks give thanks for the safety that comes when we are able to be behind you. Give thanks that you lead the way and we follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's gospel is from Mark 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on not on divine things, but on human things. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are settling your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels death and taxes. We say that those two things are the only certainties in life. And if we would read this gospel passage that was just read, if we read it out of context, it seems like the entirety of Jesus and his disciples' mission is to suffer and die. The only certainties of discipleship. And it's right to hear this reading during this season of Lent, because it's the first of three predictions of Jesus's passion, meaning his final week's journey to the cross in the book of Mark. But when we hear this text without knowing the setting, we simplify Jesus' mission to suffering and dying, kind of like death and taxes. And that is felt I think a bit more deeply this week as we've met the staggering milestone of 500,000 lives lost to COVID. And you know me, I love to talk about context. Already in the span of chapter eight, Jesus fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. He taught a lesson to the disciples and he cured a blind man. And then he goes after those things to Caesarea Philippi with his disciples and he asks them, who do you say that I am? 
And the disciple Peter confesses a truth, the truth that I'm not sure he fully understood at the time or that he agreed on the definition that Jesus had in mind. Peter said, you are the Messiah, you know, Savior, the one we have been waiting for. And Jesus told them not to tell anyone. And we pick up the story from there where Jesus speaks to the Messiah that he is. And a word on Caesarea Philippi. It was a Greco-Roman city in northern Israel, an ever-present sign of the empire in the midst of God's people. And there was a temple built to Caesar Augustus that Herod the Great had built to honor him. And this temple sat in front of a cave that was believed to be a gateway to the underworld and where the Greek god Pan lived. And I think it's interesting too, that Pan is the only Greek god that dies. You can still see the cave, the rubble of the temple and the shrines to Pan there that are carved into the cliffs. But here it is directly in the location of the Greco-Roman Empire, a site dedicated to a god of the wild who dies, that Peter confesses who Jesus is. And Jesus first acknowledges what that messiahship means, what it looks like. And today's gospel picks up in the middle of that private conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus has just acknowledged that he's the Messiah, the anointed one through whom God will deliver God's people. And the prevailing theology of the time was that this Messiah would purify society, reestablish Israel's authority from Roman rule, and bring forward an era of peace, probably done through force, through military action, through death and suffering. But Jesus says differently in the heart of Roman rule by a temple built and dedicated to the ones from whom they needed release from their suffering and death. Instead, Jesus talks about public humiliation, execution, and resurrection next to the cave where Pan, the God who dies, resides. And he speaks plainly about that rejection, suffering, and death. And it is for that reason that his followers will pick up their crosses and lose their lives. Yes, there's re resurrection, but it will always go the way of the cross. And Peter rebukes him. I think because he wanted a strong, victorious God, one who would not undergo suffering and death, but rise above it. But that kind of Messiah can only be overthrown again because it's a human type of savior. Instead, Jesus challenges him to place his trust in God's Messiah, a Messiah who is about joy and life when the empire and the world around him is about suffering and death. And seeing Jesus' rejection, suffering, and death as a source for God's joy and life, I think that ability is located in how we understand that first verse in today's reading, how we look at the word must, that Jesus must undergo rejection, suffering, and death. And that's when it needs, that sentence needs to be read in context. Because when we look beyond these immediate verses, when we look at the totality of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is rejected, suffers, and dies because powerful human forces oppose his mission, his healing, his teachings, his exorcisms, because 
They disrupt the man-made power and order. Over and over again, Jesus exercises demons to bring people back into community, into God's family. Mark is the gospel that says that you are my brothers and sisters. Jesus heals so that people can be restored and no longer sent to the margins because that's where we place them. Instead, he disrupts the system and he centers the marginalized. And not only does he center them, but he calls them, again, his brothers and sisters. Jesus is creating a new community, a new family in Christ to bring about God's kingdom. And those in power do not like that. They don't like that Jesus doesn't play by the rules and the order that they created. Those who oppose Jesus don't know that they are resisting God's kingdom. They know that they're opposing someone who is disrupting their system. For those who do know who Jesus is, who do know that the opposition is to Jesus as God, are told to keep silent until suffering and death are over, until his resurrection. And those who oppose Jesus won't know that they're resisting God's kingdom until his resurrection, until Jesus does what God does, bring joy and life. Jesus' mission was not to die, but his faithfulness to God's mission, to the healing of God's people, results in his death. Jesus must die because his commitment to the healing of God's people, to the restoration of God's covenant that God will bring life to a multitude of people, for making a family for their ancestor Abraham. Because fundamentally, Jesus's mission wasn't about death and suffering. It was about life and joy, about res restoration, about healing, about exorcism. And so he does not dial down his ministry to spare his own life or to ease his suffering but to show that God's commitment to God's people literally knows no limits, not even death. And Peter at least hears that that no limit life-giving power will not only change Jesus's mission, but him as well, and that it will change us as disciples. We too pick up the cross because our discipleship is about faithfulness to God's mission to bring healing, wholeness, and life, tirelessly working for the restoration of God's people. It means that we will lose our life, our own self-centeredness, and center the other. Center our neighbors so that the good news, the inbreaking of God's kingdom, the mission of Jesus may be done. And it won't be comfortable. It won't be all daisies or feel-good moments. But it will be divine. We will stand at the center of the world's pain, just like Jesus. And God will crush apathy, restore the broken and outcast, relieve the world's suffering, because we are on the journey to the cross as well. And that journey will always lead to Easter, where God does a new thing, where God brings joy and life for you and for the world. May this season of Lent continue to be an opportunity to journey that way, to journey for the restoration and healing of the world. We continue in song.
give thanks for those who are serving as part of the Our Savior's Church Council at this time, including the newest members, Alan Jacobs and Kelly Vollen. Usually we have installation of council members at weekend worship, but right now with all our limitations, we had our uh, installation at our most recent council meeting on Zoom, and we share some of that with you now, beginning with a reading from 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives to everyone ability for particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. You have been elected and chosen to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. And here, here is some of the phrases that I find helpful. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect the one in whose name we gather. That we are, uh, there's, a, there's a way in which we are representative of the congregation, but we are more significantly uh, called to follow where Jesus leads the way and to see that the words and deeds uh, reflect, reflect Jesus. You are to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation, that God's will is done in this community and in the whole world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving that the one Lord who empowers you is glorified. And you are to be examples of faith active in love. Martin Luther talked a lot about how our faith becomes active as we live out our lives in love to, to others. And then this names one specific way. It says you are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain the life and harmony of this congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask, are you ready to accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you've been elected and chosen? If so, say yes by the help of God. Yes, by the help of God. By help of yes, God. by the help of God. I now declare you installed as council members, officers of this congregation. God bless you with God's Holy Spirit that you may prove faithful servants of Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, in the midst of whatever each day brings, we pray for this group of leaders that you may guide and uh, lead them so that they may follow you reflect your love to this community of faith, to the congregation, 
to the larger community, and to the world. Be with us as we meet in Jesus' name. Amen. During the season of Lent, we are going to be adding the Apostles' Creed into our worship service online, and so at this time, we continue by sharing the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Church, we continue now by hearing the prayers of the people. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all those in need. Your gift of grace is for all people, holy God. Give confident faith to all the baptized, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. All the ends of the earth worship you, from galaxies to microorganisms. Preserve all your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to your creation. You rule over all nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. We uplift elected officials, police, firefighters, first responders, and military. And we especially lift up those who are distributing the vaccine and working on our front lines. Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depths of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who are suffering in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. We remember those who have asked for our prayers. Holy God, we await the day of Christ's coming in your glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. We entrust ourselves and all of our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, we're going to be sharing together the gift of communion, and so if you are at home, I invite you to pause as you gather your gifts. You will need bread or a cracker, wine or juice, and together we share in this gift. That in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to God and gave it for all of them to drink, saying, this cup, it's the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. So now at this time in your home or wherever you are at, I invite you to take communion, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.